Hi, I'm Keena Nisley with The Life of the Land is in Its Real Estate on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, I have some amazing agents from the Big Island. They are Homes and Chocolates of Keller Williams. We have Kay Alihi and Rochelle Beck. So welcome, guys. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Keena. Thanks for having us. How cool. Yes, I'm excited. So why don't you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourselves first. You want to go ahead, Rochelle? Sure thing. So I am, uh, my roots are here. I am a um, military, military youth. I've uh, been all over, born in Frankfurt, Germany, and landed here. So my family is here. I've got, uh, I've been on Hawaii Island for almost 30 years and a Hawaii real estate license um, for over 15. So loving, loving what we do here. And we live, work, and play on the big island. So, so all right. So, Kay, will you tell us your story? Uh, family's from here. I was actually born in Honolulu, uh, and that's because dad was active military at the time. So stationed there, although from here, uh, moved to the mainland, to the East Coast for a while, finished up my education in California, and then moved back. And by then, I'd already been doing real estate and development, and, and sales came later with Rochelle, but I've always been in architecture, construction, or real estate in one way or another. Oh, great. Okay. So you guys are homes and chocolate. So can you tell us a little story about, about your team name? Yes. Yeah, so I'm a chocoholic realtor, chocoholic agent, always seem to have it nearby. Uh, I've had the palette for the finer chocolates. Uh, but more importantly, we are actually known for gifting and sharing chocolates from our Big Island Candies, which is a local cookie chocolatier here on island, and they've been here since 1977. Yes, I go every yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I go there, you know, pretty regularly, uh, support them. We are also, um, you know, supporters and sponsors of the Big Island Chocolate Festival that they have in Waikoloa. Wow. Yeah, yep. that is great. So I brought you guys on because I want to learn more about buying a home or land on the big island. And we get a lot of clients calling, as I, as I was telling you, a lot of the tech kids are now thinking they can work remotely in Hawaii is where they want to be. So I want to learn more and I'm sure our viewers want to learn more about how and, and what can you buy on, on the big island. So first of all, let's talk about how, how would you buy something on the big island? How would they get started? Well, the, the process is pretty much the same as anywhere else. Uh, we, we recommend understanding what your finance picture is, uh, either pre-qualification or cash. Um, financing here is a little different. We, we do have lava hazard zones and other things that aren't in other parts of the, the state or in the rest of the country. Um, but yeah, between having the right agent and understanding your finance picture, we can figure out what makes sense from there. It's just really just conversations about what your lifestyle choices are and, and how we can support that. So what is a lava hazard zone? Um, our USGS, U United States Geological Service, our survey, they basically rate the different hazards and basically it's, it's how recently it has a lava flow across this area. So they look at Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, Kilauea, and they've divided it up into nine different hazard zones. Um, zones three through nine are what we call low risk and it's all relatively low risk and we classify that as low risk because banks will lend on it um, insurers will will underwrite so it's pretty straightforward in that sense when we get to lava zone two there are a few more restrictions and then when we get to lava zone one being the highest hazard zone there are even more restrictions so it's, it's just a question of understanding um, that risk and, and how to recover it so Basically, in Lava Zone 1 and 2, are they able to get financing at all, or is that going to be a straight cash purchase? And is it is it really something someone would want to buy? Uh, the want part's the easiest part to address because everyone's so different. Um, there are some people that want to be remote, and they don't want to spend a lot of money on their land. And, and Lava Zone 1 is the right place to do that. Um, with that being said, it is harder to borrow in Lava Zones 1 and 2. Um, there are lenders out there in Lava Zone 1, but for every 10 lenders you have for Lava Zone 3, you might have three lenders for Lava Zone 2 and one lender for Lava Zone 1. So it's, it's, it shrinks your options dramatically the lower you go in those hazard zones. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but it's a trade-off for some of the people, like Kili East said, that like to be remote. Many of the properties that are in that lava zone, they also have a meet. They're 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 minutes from amazing views, minutes from breathtaking ocean, um, you know, nearby. And if that is the lifestyle and what they're looking for, um, it, it it's very much worth it, you know, because it's not the hustle and the bustle. There's no need to come into town on a regular basis, and they have the ability to build what they want when they want. Yeah, the, the beauty to that is you're, you're more connected to the land if you're on Lava Zone 1. Um, and part of that's forced or part of that's decision. And the forced part is the infrastructure, the water, the power is much less. So if you want catchment water, if you want an off-grid solar home, Lava Zone 1 is a great place to do it. So can they get electric in Lava Zone 1 and, and 2? I mean, is there an option to run run electric if, I mean... I do promote solar, but if they want to have electric, is that even an option? Um, in some places it is, yes. Um, our utilities, for example, Helco in this case, White Electric Light Company, they're not running new utility lines in those areas, but decades ago and still in service are the existing lines. Yeah. Oh, so how how is the market for the Lava Zone 1s and 2s? Do you see a lot of people coming in and, and buying those up? Are there a lot available? There, there are a lot available, and part of that is from when those areas were developed. Around the time that Hawaii entered the Union, call it 1958, 1959, there was a lot of thought that there's now this tropical paradise that is recognized as the 50th state of the United States, and everyone's going to want a home there because of the political stability. So we had tens of thousands of lots open in that area, which is now Lava Zone 1 or 2, uh, mostly in uh, Lower Puna. And we probably got 20, 30,000 lots that are out there and maybe only a fourth of them were actually lived on. And so there's a lot of places out there where, where people can go and, and you have that option, yeah. So I know we, we just had, um lava flow there recently like in, in the last you know few years how mm -hmm. did that um ha what, what happens to that land after i guess that's that was always a question of mine after the lava flows over it it's new mm -hmm. land but so how does all that work okay so there are a couple ways that it works one people always ask about the coastline and our state supreme court set, uh, settled that debate years ago they basically said any new land created belongs to the state of hawaii um, if you have a land that is in, in place, a, a parcel, and it is covered with lava, it basically just means that your elevation of your property is raised by whatever depth the lava is. It's, it's still your property. Um, where it changes, though, is access. So a lot of times the roads get covered. Mm -hmm. And in recognition of that, our county real property tax office often zeroes out the accessible value on the property. So if you had a property which was once worth $100,000 in the open market, and you were paying $1,000 a year on it, now it's it could be technically worth nothing, although there is always value in land, nothing on the real estate market in terms of sales. So our county comes through and says, okay, we're not gonna charge you property taxes on that property now. Right, right. when the lava flow happened, many of the property owners noticed that their, um, their HELCO bills that were mailed out to them were zeroed out. They noticed that there were property tax office that came to them in the mail, even though they got the document, it, that was the value was, you know, down to zero as well. And so whether they lived here or not, they, they knew that um, there was no value based on the property tax for, you know, for mm -hmm. that property owner. And as yeah. Kelly, you mentioned, it is, it is down to the access. Many people still have the ability to sell, you know, sell the land, but it's the access that's the bigger, um, the bigger question. Yeah, the, the thing that happened with values in, in some of those areas was, for example, if there was a $50,000 lot and it was worth that in April of 2018, and then in May of 2018, the lava flows in, uh, the earthquake started and they lasted about a year. And so those prices went from about $50,000 down to about $10,000. Um, quickly after that, and as of the beginning of this year, I'd say probably 80%, 85, 90% of those values have been recouped with people buying back into the area. Wow. Yeah. So I guess that, that leads into my next question. Were those people able to, to uh, rebuild or, or sell and let others 
uh, build on it? Is that something you can do? Yeah, so a lot of people, if the homes weren't damaged, for example, and if it was just a question of access, people are allowed back into the area. Um, if the homes were burned, um, a lot of the rebuild came down to insurance. When is the insurance going to pay out? And if it's, let's say, directly in the path and it was literally covered with lava, there's a lot of questions with the county, whether the county would let them rebuild and what that would be. But most of the people were either allowed to return to their homes, return to the property or rebuild. Um, but because of how long it takes for permits and how long it takes for insurance payouts, most of those people that lost their homes have not rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Many people in the area too, they, you know, if they weren't uh, required to evacuate, there is a part of the subdivision where um, the lava kind of missed and many of them chose to stay there until they were told to leave. So there are still a good amount of residents that still live at the top of the subdivision um, and, and it's, it's life as usual for them uh, because they are, um, you know, they didn't have to uproot. It was a risk they knew that they were taking, but it was definitely something that they were willing to, to wait out. Not just the subdivision that was directly affected by the lava, but some others that the lava would have flowed near. And so, yeah, a lot of the residents, you know, they knew that it was a possibility, but it was something that they were willing to, um, to take that step until they needed to. So yeah, so when we were we were visiting there, we, we usually go once a year. We did see they were re, redoing some of the roads. So are they planning um, on um, putting the access back? Or, I mean, I know <laughs> I'm sure yours your your roads are like ours eventually. But yeah, yeah. so um, <laughs> what is their plan with that? Do they plan on giving access back to these properties? I think some of the properties in the foreseeable future will not get access. They concentrated on reestablishing the major evacuation routes as a priority. So a lot of those roads have been opened already. And I think it's just a question of chipping away like little by little, but the areas that were at the heart of what happened, for example, Leilani Estates, because of the volume of lava in that area, there won't be any reopening of some of those roads probably ever again, just because of the extent of damage and walls of lava 30 40 feet high we have cinder cones now that are 50 60 100 feet high and mm -hmm. those will just never get removed yeah so um so during this lava flow were, were you able to sell any houses <laughs> yeah houses were selling unfortunately probably not the way we would have liked them to there was quite a bit of panic just like any other natural disaster so some some savvy investors made out very well. There were homes that were once 200,000, 250,000 selling for 10 cents on the dollar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't participate in any of that just because we felt like it was kind of taking advantage of a situation and we, we didn't think that that was the right thing to do. So we kind of stayed out of that market for almost a year just, just to let people heal, let the emotions come back down to where they should have been. Oh, yeah. And I, I think Rochelle kind of had a crazy buyer, too, didn't you, during that time? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. You know, for, for one thing, I had, um, you know, some people that were interested in the area because they were also well aware that it was only the people that had property in the area were allowed into the space, right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, same with when the lava was flowing and didn't exactly flow, um, you know, actively. It was only the people that had property there that were allowed to be that close because they were near the property. And this goes back, you know, way before the recent lava flow, you know, where we had, I had side by side lots that were listed for 6,000 and there was clearly lava under them and it was, you know, disclose, disclose. And, and again, it was, it was for the reason of having property in that subdivision so that they can come and go as they, as they wanted to, to capture the lava that they, they wanted to, you know, appreciate. And it was only, it, that was their main reason. They knew well aware that it, they couldn't identify the boundaries, but yeah, that was their biggest, um, biggest reason. Uh, so yeah. 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 It, it was sad too, because on the flip side, we had, we had some people that we recently sold property to um, in, in certain subdivisions. And, uh, and it was, you know, although it was a second home, it was still a home to them. And so it, that part was very sad to see, you know, the social media with the lava flow that had, that had covered the subdivision in such yeah. a short period of time. Um, you know, there was a you know, happy ending to this story. We did help them, um, you know, find something else in the end. But yeah, that, that was hard. The clients that we helped find a home 
build a home in that subdivision. That was really challenging, but in the end, there were there were good good endings to a lot of those stories. So there are options on the Big Island that are not in lava flow areas, correct? Just because I know we, we may be sending you buyers. So uh, <laughs> what, what other type of properties are available on the Big Island? Well, by comparison, just to put it in perspective, during the 2018-2019 uh, eruptions and lava flows, it only affected about 5% of our land mass. So 95% was left unaffected, people buying, selling, renting, investing. So that that was just going. I mean, Hawaii, the Big Island, is, is known for ranch land. It's known for for beaches. Um, we, we have fourteen thousand foot mountains. So there there is a, a wide variety of different property types that, that people enjoy here, and they're all available. And most of that wasn't affected by our lava flows or our earthquakes. Mm -hmm. Yep, our island is very diverse. We have the luxury of you know having luxury properties but we also have you know the commercial so you you've got somebody that wants to start their own business they're able to do that you've got you know people that want to get away from the city you can buy you know a one acre parcel but still be 20 minutes from town uh, you can still have pavement um, on a 15,000 uh, lot for only ten thousand dollars there's so many options and it's so diverse that it isn't something that you can come over and maybe spend just the weekend to you know look and purchase it's it's really good to get your research and you know kind of have an idea of what you want to do what your end result is how you want to you know uh, enjoy the property and as Kay that you mentioned earlier the lifestyle that you want to have what do you want to be minutes from because yes you can be minutes from so much you know whether it's views walking parks um, and yet you can still have that community camaraderie, which we love, you know, in, in this, our, our town of Hilo, you know, we can still drive to see others, you know, over the hill and it takes about an hour and a half. Um, but we still have the ability to have such a diversity from the rainforest to the city um, and, and concerts and theater. And so that's what makes it, you know, so enjoyable. It's, it's what we're able to do when we're not working. It's who we're able to hang with when we're not doing real estate yeah yeah so so after the volcanoes and, and everything settled down then you had COVID-19 so <laughs> talk about yes it's kind of like Jumanji over there um so let's talk about how has the COVID-19 changed your market or has it impacted your market on the big island it has um some ways are predictable some are not um I think to get a better understanding of it um People like to conveniently think of our island as being East Hawaii and West Hawaii. This, the center of East Hawaii being Hilo, the center of West Hawaii being Kona. Um, the West side being more tourist driven, the East side being more local or government driven. Um, and so our economies, the two different economies got affected very differently. Um, we did see a slowdown. There's a lot of panic in the beginning. Um, West Hawaii, unfortunately, I think they were, they were hit a little harder because without hotels being open, without flights coming in, um, we saw values drop considerably on the west side, um, a little more modest drops on the east side, but both have started to recover already. And I think a lot of that has to do with the resilience of the people that are here. Um, and it also, I think, has to do with the way the real estate industry is adapting. Um, like, like now, Zoom. I mean, Zoom and other virtual services, other ways to service clients, that was a lifesaver for for everybody um it allowed people to continue to to buy homes because not every home choice is is a luxury or a second home choice there's still people that are moving to the islands for work or for family and so for those clients to be able to find homes and the agents to be able to provide the services there was a big pivot a big shift in there that happened in the real estate industry and um, i think it's a shift that's here to stay and and we're we're pretty close we're maybe only off by about five percent on average uh, call it median prices on our on our homes. Um, and part of that was just because pre-COVID-19, we were at an all-time low on inventory. And although we lost some buyers in the whole thing, some of our sellers decided to wait it out. So we're, we're still a strong seller's market. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're kind of seeing the same thing here in Oahu. It seems like, you know, if it's come on, like in the last two weeks, we've had 390 new listings but we've opened 392 escrows island-wide. Um, so we, we too are experiencing a very low inventory as I think people are waiting to list their homes. Uh, so uh, how, how, what are your numbers like there? 
you um, the stats and and over over time, are you guys pretty consistent? Is it a good investment? Um, you know, I work with a lot of investors. You were very excited last night to meet up that I was gonna uh, have some big island real estate agents because some are interested in investing there. So, what is your long term? How has that been? Uh, we, we're still on a, a steady increase in property values, um, whether it be land, whether it be condominium, or whether it be single family. Now, each of those fluctuates a little bit with the short term market. Um, so, for example, single family home values are up, up over this time last year, um, up over this time last month. So, single family kind of drives our market. Uh, east side, there's very little condominium. Um, so I think when we look at condominium and, and even vacant land, it's it's the inventory. So we'll see like numbers are way down in terms of number of sales. And that's just because there are not a lot of listings. Um, so when you look at the average price that things are selling at, they're still climbing. There are exceptions here and there. Like our strongest markets are um, Hilo Town. So that would be the South Hilo District and the Pune District. Um, on the west side, we have North Kona and South Kohala. Um, the other areas, they, they fluctuate a little more and it's hard to, to gauge them. So to put it in perspective for that, North Kohala, you'll literally only get a handful of transactions. Mm -hmm. um, Hamakua, which is so popular because of the, the, the rainbows and the waterfalls, in a year you might get eight home sales there. And so you, we, you don't, we don't look at those average numbers at all because if one house sells for a lot more and a lot less, it pulls the average way down. So we in some of those areas, we, we kind of ignore the stats and look at what's going on around it. And because Kilo and Kona, we have enough enough volume, enough number of sales to get true averages and what those averages mean. So yeah. Yeah. some of the things that we've been seeing too is there have been an increase in the interest in land, more so because of you know the desire to come to Hawaii to build what you'd like on acreage. Uh, and now that the prices for vacant land uh, are reasonable or affordable, um, you know, to many to, to start. Um, the other thing is the condos, the condo sales, even though there aren't that many condo sales in Hilo, you're, you're noticing condo sales uh, going into escrow in Waikoloa and Kona side, also because of the ability for an owner to move right into it when it closes, right? I mean, we yeah. had the luxury of having a, having uh, property close and our, um, you know, the, the, they address the quarantine by moving into the home that had already closed the day before. And so with the condo sales, that has been, um, you know, something that we've seen recently where the condo sales have increased as well at, because of, you know, the ability to quarantine right at your, at your condo. Yeah. I think one of the things that you touched on, Rochelle, that that's really good right now is because of the 2018, 2019, seismic activity we had people panicked and that and in those time periods people were not buying land so 2018 2019 vacant land values fell so if you're looking for the investment it's vacant land because early 2020 pre-covid it had started to increase and outpace the value of condos and single family and then covid 19 um, kind of put a freeze on that let's call it the increase in value so those are still the, the parts of our real estate that are undervalued. And I say, you know, you look at the land now because if it's going to continue to recover the way it was before, mm -hmm. that 2018, 2019 memory is going to fade. And so there's still opportunities to get land there because the land value is more down compared to that time frame when the rest of everything is climbing. So that does lead us in. We actually do have a viewer question. And um, they're asking about future of volcanic activity, which we do have to preface with. We don't have a crystal ball. Uh, but but you, I'm sure there's there's talk there. And then what is the cost of the insurance um, protection? I know you do run a little different insurance there because of volcanic activity. Yeah. So yeah, the, 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 we can't tell what's going to happen with the volcano. We, we leave that to the USGS and the University of Hawaii to kind of make their forecasts. Um, in terms of insurance, to put it in perspective, so for example, on a home in Lava Zone 3, if your homeowner's insurance policy, which includes hazards, would cost you $150 a month, and you buy the same house located in Lava Zone 2, you can expect to pay about a 25% premium on that. So 
you know, you, instead of 150, you might be closer to 200, 225, you know, you should be any higher than that. You, you know, 200 would be the most per month. That's kind of offset by purchase price. It does. It does. And most people don't realize that. And it's, it's kind of one of those things where you're looking at financing, look at the whole picture, what's, what's the actual out of pocket, not what is the price of the house? Yeah. yeah. So, no. So I have learned a ton. I mean, there's so much more I want to know. Um, we need to do a whole nother show about living off the grid. <laughs> um, Cause I know I hear that phrase so often people want to move here, buy on the West side and live off the grid. And I'm like, why? But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that could be a really interesting topic for those those people that do want to come over and 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 do you know just that, which is totally possible there because you guys do have the water catchment. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure we covered that if, if a lot of people understand water catchment. So if you want to explain that really quick, we do have a couple minutes. But I do sure. think buyers coming from the mainland need to understand where you guys get your water on the Big Island. <laughs> Okay, so water catchment or cistern, um, basically it's it's people look at, you know, the aerial photos and they say, wow, look at all the swimming pools in the backyard in Hawaii. <laughs> well, it, it's it's a big bathtub, basically. It's, it's a tank. We catch the water from the roof. We filter it, um, run it through the house. So it's it's perfectly usable, potable water. Uh, it's just not coming through a pipe from a central treatment plant. That's the only difference. Yeah, in addition, uh, you know, for me, uh, it the catchment tanks they do have uh frames that you can put a cover on it you know so it's not just you know catching the rainfall uh it does filter as kelly e said and there's there's uh water companies that can help you with the cleaning you know not just cleaning it yourself but replacing you know the items you know the nice thing is that you are actually in control of the cleanliness how frequent uh, you know as far as the the catchment goes so yeah. All right. <laughs> Great. I learned a ton. I know, um, you know, incoming buyers, if you want to throw out uh, your blurb really quick, I'm getting the one minute notification. We're going to get yeah. deep. <laughs> no, no worries. Don't worry. Well, yeah. you know, with Kelly and Rochelle back with Homes and Chocolate on the Big Island, we're going to help you with commercial uh, lease residential sales. Uh, we live and work on the Big Island. We're here to help you. And we just love the opportunity. So give us a call. Homesandchocolate.com. Yes. And I can vouch they are amazing. So um, yeah, you can reach out to me and I can connect you directly. You can reach out to them directly, but they definitely are our go-to. Anybody says Big Island, I say, yeah, call the Bex. Um, So yeah. So thanks guys. It was great to see you. You as well. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. This was awesome. All right. Okay. Thank you. That was Life of the Land is in its real estate. And I will see you guys in a couple weeks.